via telephone, the uh, State Director of Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia Chapter, Jason Nuffman. Good morning, Jason. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you this morning? Good. Do you have any bee stories for us? Are you, are you a feared bee fighter yourself? Uh, my, my, my weekend was uh, less eventful than Bill's, it sounds like. But <laughs> I, I prefer gasoline. That's, that's my methodology for bee clearing out, especially well, when they're in the ground. Well, let me pick up on that if I can, Jason. The, the, and I do, too. That's where you burn them out. Uh, this one's un, under my porch. Uh, so you don't just throw a five-gallon <laughs> container of gas. But that's what I did do. I used a small amount of kerosene and put it under my porch. And hopefully uh, the bees would be burned out before I burn my porch down. But it's a, it looked out. I was able to do Is it. the porch connected to your home? Yeah, the porch is connected to the home. <laughs> that's right. So, so it was a little bit of a dicey game. You want enough flame to burn. You want enough heat to burn them out. But you do not want to have enough to burn the porch i.e. the house down jason last week americans for prosperity entered, um, uh, endorsed patrick morrissey the current attorney general for governor in the state of west virginia can you tell me what went into that decision well sure and i think that you know your your audience is probably fairly acquainted with what we do but but for those that aren't first and foremost we're a principles-based policy organization, and our principles are, are pretty simple. Freedom plus opportunity equals prosperity. And, you know, that mentality has really led to us playing a, a crucial role in ensuring the enactment of, of some of the most transformational policies in West Virginia to date. You know, things like the largest tax cut in state history, uh, introducing the, the gold standard for educational freedom in the country with the Hope Scholarship. And so we want to continue achieving those kind of rapid transformational things that, that we know West Virginians deserve. And as an organization, we just thought, hey, you know, we need to step up uh, and thoughtfully support a candidate for governor um, that is a true policy leader, somebody that's unafraid to take on the special interests and enact bold policy changes. And, and that's why we've endorsed Attorney General Patrick Morrissey for governor, because he's just demonstrated time and time again that he's that kind of bold leader that, you know, he's He's not afraid to uh, take on the tough fights and, and make the state a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Have you folks done many endorsements in the past, Jason? Yeah, throughout the years we've done uh, several endorsements in the state legislature, um, and this is the first time that we've, we've ever endorsed a gubernatorial candidate. Is there a downside risk to endorsing a candidate this high up? I don't, I don't think so. In fact, you know, listen, we're, we're just at a crucial time in the state where, you know, we can either double down on, on policies that we know are helping West Virginians thrive or, or we can choose to take our foot off the gas. And obviously, you, you, you probably can guess which camp I'm in on that. we got to keep moving forward uh, with real meaningful, you know, action, not, not a bunch of hollow words and, and tinkering around the margins. And so uh, we believe and know that, that – from the experience that we've had in working with uh, Attorney General Morrissey, that he's the experienced leader that that has the you know the grit and the vision to to keep accomplishing historic policy wins. So I, I don't see a downside to it myself. When you looked at the other candidates, was this a tough decision or a fairly easy one? I, I think it was it was fairly easy. I mean, listen, you know, having competitive elections, uh, particularly in the primary, I think it's it's good for the free market of ideas. It's it's good for citizens to be able to be empowered uh, when it comes to how policy is made. But most importantly, uh, it, it helps folks to hold policymakers accountable. And I think it just results in, in better outcomes for folks. Um, but I think, you know, Patrick Morrissey head and shoulders above the competition. Uh, just, I mean, look, look at the historic crucial wins that he's led uh, litigating for the, you know, the United States Supreme Court. I mean, whether it was, uh, stopping President Obama's war on coal when they overturned the Clean Power Plan, uh, or you know this this recent historic reining in of you know rogue federal bureaucrats in West Virginia versus EPA. I mean he's, he's had some of the most significant rulings under his belt in the last couple of decades, and and kind of laid a blueprint out for other attorney generals across the country. You know if, if they want to safeguard their states and and frankly Americans from being trampled on by Washington. Will you be issuing any other endorsements for any of the other major offices in West Virginia? 
Uh, that's to be determined. I mean, right now we're looking at the field develop in a couple of different areas, uh, particularly, obviously, in the state legislature, which is the bulk of our work in elections, usually. Uh, and so, um, I mean, right now we're, we're focused on having conversations with West Virginians at the doorstep. Uh, I think we're doing something like 5,000 doors a week between staff and activists across the state, and really just trying to build that grassroots muscle. One of the things that sets us apart from many of the other organizations in the, in the state and in, in the country, frankly, uh, is that we have a permanent grassroots infrastructure. I mean, we have folks that are in communities uh, having conversations with activists and, and recruiting folks um, who are of like mind about uh, freedom and opportunity. And, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to just build that capability out and see where it takes us. Bill. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Jason. A couple of things. Uh, with the endorsement for uh, uh, Patrick Marcy, is there also a financial contribution as well? Well, yeah, I think we're going we're gonna to have pretty much a, a seven-figure investment to drive momentum in that race. And that, that includes uh, you know, ads and talking to folks and going door-to-door, -door, like I said, um, because, you know, uh, at the end of the day, sometimes you, you got to realize that free speech isn't free, right? And so to be able to get the message out there and communicate with people, that's what it takes. Yeah. I, I, Club for Growth, as you uh, realize, I, I think is given up to $10 million for Patrick Marcy. So uh, uh, so with the two large uh, PA PACs, uh, that's, that's quite a boost to, uh, to, uh, to, to Mr. Marcy. So. Yeah. Well, certainly, and I think he's, you know, at base, he's a strong campaigner anyway. I mean, he's one of the folks that really, uh, he likes to get out and talk to people. He likes to let them know uh, what the Office of Attorney General is working on. And, uh, you know, I think, frankly, more, more politicians in West Virginia would be well-suited to uh, endeavor to communicate with people to that level. Um, just to let them know what, what their dollars are going for in terms of the tax money that, that uh, is being spent. And, you know, when... A big win happens. Um, the attorney general, for instance, uh, like when he helped defend the Hope Scholarship in the state Supreme Court, uh, he likes to make sure that folks are aware of that because uh, it impacts their lives. I mean, that, that decision in, in particular was very important for parents and students uh, and educators across the state. And so, you know, he just does a good job of getting out there and, and talking about um, really the, the things that are going to impact the people the most. In your early history of Americans for Prosperity, there was a strong economic component to it. That was kind of the driving force. Is that still a major component to your decision-making today? Oh, I think so, certainly. I think so. Um, really, if you look at the, the bulk of our work, it's, it's in that economic space. Um, because we know that, again, um, there's a lot of work left to be done in the state. Uh, a lot of regulatory cleanup, a lot of systemic changes that we know, uh, barriers that are standing in the way of folks being able to uh, have employment, to enter the workforce. And uh, we want to see those things sort of supercharged. Um, obviously, you know, we had a big win in terms of the largest tax cut in state history, but um, we would like to see rates reduced even further. And, and some of that is baked into that tax law with triggers that will continue to lower the income tax rate and uh there's all kinds of reforms left that i think we could really do west virginia is within you know i think i forget what the old statistic folks used to throw around is but we're within a relatively short drive time of much of the east coast's population and so we're really situated well uh, to be a more powerful economy uh, and really to, to help folks to be able to you know have opportunity in, in an environment that fosters uh, people thriving. And, and we, we need to really set the policy table, if you will, uh, for folks to be able to experience that more. Yeah, looking at your webpage last night in preparation for you coming on today, I noticed that you're, it's a grassroots organization with, within in 35 states. Uh, are you involved in any of the states besides West Virginia? Uh, no, I just, I just run the one here. Okay. Um, and have been doing that since about 2015. But you're right, Bill. We we do. We're up to 38 state chapters. Okay. I think. They just okay. opened one in Wyoming and one in Alabama, and uh, but we have a presence in all 50 states and activists in all 50 states. Um, and a lot of that is to you know leverage our work at the federal policy level. I mean, right now you look at what's happening in Washington D.C. Uh, it's just, uh, I mean, 
it's shameful, really. Um, you know, President Biden out here talking about uh, Bidenomics and how well that's working uh, is farcical at best. Uh, I mean, obviously, historic inflation, uh, trillions in spending from the federal government, and we know that that works out to uh, essentially cost taxpayers more, make for an economy that uh, does not function properly and really is hurting people with the gas pump and the grocery store and everywhere else. And so uh, we want to see some more common sense policies at the federal level. And, you know, frankly, uh, states have got to step up in an environment like this to make sure they're safeguarding uh, the citizens of West Virginia. And that's why, you know, again, we're taking such a, a, a early approach to endorsing somebody for governor that we think has an aggressive vision, has a, a clear vision uh, in terms of both policy and, and where he wants the state to go with Patrick Morrissey. Uh, Rob asked earlier, were you look, uh, considering other candidates in the state? Have you, uh, uh, are you considering other candidates? Yeah, yeah, we are. We are. We're continuing to look at the, the field, uh, particularly in the state legislature. And, um, you know, we, we have a, essentially two criteria that we look at. One, is there a policy champion in the race? And two is, can we make an impact there? And so it's through that lens that we're, we're kind of looking at the rest of the field. Would you be willing to mention some names, or is it premature? I think probably premature okay. at this point. Okay. Those are internal decisions that we're continuing to make and, and continuing to look at, uh, although I would, I would wager a guess that there'll be some of those up in your all's neck of the woods. Okay. The, uh, uh, you, you mentioned the national level some. Uh, looking at the organization in total, how, what percent is directed toward national elections, national policies, as opposed to what we say at the state level, i.e. West Virginia? Um, well, I mean, you know, our full-time work here and my full-time job is to enact policy changes in the state of West Virginia. And I've lived in West Virginia my whole life, born and raised in Buckhannon down the road there from y'all. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a large part of our work. We, we do uh, engage on federal policy in so much as, um, obviously, West Virginia has a federal delegation. And so we connect our activists to those folks and uh, try to drive some policy change on the federal level. Uh, and so I would say that um, in terms of the, the electoral side of things, I, I think the uh, number is something to the effect of 450 uh, state legislative and otherwise races that, that we worked on across the country. So, uh, and I, can t I, I would anticipate that number being larger this year. The other big race in West Virginia, of course, every race is large, depending upon uh, uh, who you are and what you, what perspective uh, you're approaching. But the other big race would be the Senate race, uh, the primary between Governor Justice and uh, uh, Congressman Mooney. Uh, have you looked at that race at all? Do you anticipate that you may get involved in that race, or that will be one you stand back and say just just kind of a point of interest? I have a high degree of confidence that it's likely we will become involved in that. But I'll tell you, Bill, right now, what we're most concerned with is essentially trying to get Senator Manchin just to do a little bit better and represent the people of West Virginia in a, in a more uh, rep representative of our values in West Virginia. I mean, right now, um, you know, he has taken a stance that essentially, uh, you know, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, for instance, which we've talked about before. You know, he's taking a victory lap saying, look what a great job I did getting the Mountain Valley Pipeline done, when in reality, uh, he could have done that two years ago when he and President Biden authored together the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which I think a lot of folks viewed for what it was, which was uh, a, a grab bag of bad policies that the left wanted done, and, and Joe Manchin enabled that. So right now, the, the message for Senator Manchin from us is please do better, because we're in a really tight spot as a country economically, uh, and we need some folks to step up and represent the people in a way that uh, holds true to, to our values of you know, uh, fiscal responsibility and trying to help people put food on the table. Well, the way that you've, you've answered my question is, implies that you'll take a pass on the primary and wait for the general. Is that fair? I, I think that's possibly a fair analysis bill speaking of senator manchin any indication jason anything you're hearing in any channels as to what he's going to decide to do uh i 
I think he's going to run for president. If if you ask me, you know, this week, you you, you never really can nail down uh, what somebody's going to do. Um, but if I had to guess, that's what it looks like to me. Why do you think it looks like that? Well, I mean, you know, again, he's taken some pretty bad votes that have uh, tanked his his poll numbers in the state, and so there's a lot of speculation that perhaps. Um, even he doesn't think he could win a race for U.S. Senate in West Virginia. And so I think that uh, that paired with uh, some groups uh, encouraging him to run for a third-party bid for president uh, make that an increasing likelihood. A person with uh, a lot of political experience told me recently that they felt Manchin was setting himself up for another run at Senate because he had been making statements that were critical specifically of President Biden. So he was trying to separate or distance himself from the president, thereby setting himself up better to run as a person who would not be uh, an automatic checkmark for what the president's policies and uh, perhaps giving himself a little bit more credibility as a Democrat who could stand in the way of any national Democratic agenda that took us further to the left. Do you buy that? Uh, I I mean, potentially, yes, but I, it kind of slaps as disingenuous for Manchin to take that stance, right? Because, you know, here, here's a guy who one of his, you know, crowning achievements in the last two years has been offering a bill with President Biden, the Inflation Reduction Act. And, you know, I mean, Rob, he's kind of flip-flopped all over the place on where he's at on his own bill. I mean, a couple of months ago, he was saying we ought to repeal it. Uh, now he's saying that it's the best thing that you know he's ever done legislatively, and so I, I don't know. I kind of think West Virginians see right through it and, and see it for what it is, which is political posture. This is an interesting state when it comes to the governor's position because it was a state that really, for the longest time, with rare exception, elected Democratic governors. Even Jim Justice, while Republicans were busy taking over Charleston, stood out in that he was elected governor first as a Democrat. Do you give Democrats any kind of legitimate chance coming up in this next election? Uh, I, I think we're, we're in such an interesting spot politically, uh, and the, the state has changed so rapidly. Um, really, Republicans are kind of in the spot that Democrats used to be in, where pretty much everything was decided in the primary. And I think that Democrats are going to have an extremely tough road to hoe. Um, coming up in the general, I, I don't see a whole lot of pathways to success for them, um, save some of the you know state legislative seats that that are particularly blue, right? And there aren't very many of them. And so I, it, I think it's just a, a pendulum swing in the opposite direction of where it was for, you know, the better part of 80 years. And uh, I think a lot of that is due to the, the national Democrat party uh, sort of stepping outside of the boundaries of what I think Democrats in the state perhaps thought uh, they should be focused on. Jason, uh, uh, President Clinton once said quite famously, it's all in the, uh, it's all in the pocketbook. It's the economy stupid. It's the economy stupid. Uh, an argument is being made uh that the economy is looking better than anticipated. Uh, inflation is down than what it was. Now, people argue that it's higher than it was uh, uh, four or five years ago, but it's come, come down significantly. It looks like that we'll probably not have a recession. It'll be a soft, uh, soft landing. Employment is up. So a lot of the indicators uh, can be used by the objective viewer as being better than what anticipated. Uh, do you think, one, do you buy into this argument? And second, do you think it's going to have much of a play in the upcoming election? Well, I think that, that folks have a little bit longer of a memory than, than often given credit for. And the reason I say that is because, you know, um, yeah, under the last administration, uh, America had one of the best economies since the 1950s. And so uh, we obviously went through a pandemic and went through <laughs> trillions and trillions and dollars of spending at the federal level, uh, which have negatively impacted, uh, among other things, that, that good economic outlook. So to say that we're getting better, I mean, sure, 
um, we're we're getting better from the standpoint of uh, the economy was in utter shambles. Uh, we still have lingering supply chain issues. Uh, we still have inflation at an unacceptable level, uh, albeit it has come down. Uh, I don't think that's attributable to anything that Washington has done. Uh, I think that's mostly private sector actors doing what they do best and, and trying to provide for people and things. And so uh, I think at the end of the day, is it is it improving? Yes. Uh, the folks still go to the grocery store and see that, you know, uh, chicken breast costs 30 percent more than it did not that long ago. I, I think they do. And so um, to your point, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, the, the Clinton administration and uh, Mr. Carvel who said it's the economy stupid and it still rings true today. And I don't think that Joe Biden's going to get out from underneath what he has done to the economy from this sort of central planning, uh, very, very left um, policy agenda that he's pushed. Final minute here, Jason. There will be an interim session that could possibly contain a special session as well, dealing with how to spend whatever surplus is left over here. I've talked to the financial leaders of the state, Eric Tarr in the House, Eric Householder in the uh, Eric Tarr in the Senate, Eric Householder in the House, and both seem to agree that it's very probable a trigger has been activated to add another tenth of a percent income tax reduction at the state taxation levels. Uh, is that something AFP West Virginia will be pushing for actively as the legislature regathers? Well, you know, the great thing about have something uh, having a trigger in your tax code is that uh, ideally it would just occur because it's the letter of the law, right? If we hit the right triggers um, for that to go forward, um, it, it's law already, right? That was one of the, the big things that we wanted to make sure was included uh, in the tax package and for that exact reason so that we, we don't have a one-time tax cut, but instead we have uh, a, a general move to phase out the income tax in West Virginia in a, in a fiscally responsible fashion over time. And so if, if the revenue is there, which I think it probably is, um, we'd like to see that law that's on the books uh, come to fruition with another 10 percent tax increase uh, sorry tax decrease yeah watch how you say that Jason. <laughs> bill almost jumped out of his seat <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you got i love that our reputation is such that if i say tax increase you all get really concerned they just, you know, maybe got a flu or a fever so. it, it was instant anger over here <laughs> yeah, you've done well jason you've done well <laughs> jason how can people find out more about americans for prosperity i would say take a look at prosperityispossible.com. Good to talk with you again, Jason. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Jason. Day.